So our board uh, a year and a half ago said, well, we're to the point where it's 25 years, you know, a little bit more than $4 billion later of cleanup, there's much to celebrate. And in fact, uh, one of our vice president, Jane Fay, is here. Uh, I'll acknowledge over time some of our other trustees. But we really felt it was important to bring attention to the fact that A, the part of those clean up this winter, most time. But also, where do we go from here? Right now, we're at 84% of the Boston Harbor Walk public access system is complete. So, through the six waterfront neighborhoods of Boston, you can walk much of the world. And that's again thanks to the efforts of the private property owners, agencies like the Massachusetts. Port Authority, Boston Development Authority, and of course the regulatory efforts of the Department of Environmental Protection through their Chapter 91 program. And Ben Lynch and Andrea Lighthouser and Alex and all of you have done much at DMP to ensure that there's a public access and also the wonderful amenities that you see along the Harbor Walk. Uh, for those of you, we recently did a great in the Harbor Walk in Lake May. People were not uh, astonished that there were three telescopes. Not one, not two, but not unusual on certain properties to have three and four. We are probably one of the few cities in the United States where you can look out onto the harbor, three telescopes, free of charge, including very various telescopes that are um, at a level that people that are in wheelchairs and children can use. So if you go, for example, to the <coughs> house or, or, or uh, places like that in a far more furious and so as an organization that promotes public access, not only for uh, adults, but also for children and people of all over here. And it is an important vision that we have going into the 21st century. The other thing, of course, is the Back to the Beaches program, and you'll hear about that later on, but of course, TBHA in the early 1990s, thanks to support, uh, by the uh, state senate, uh, $30 million was appropriated to uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Initiated at the state set on the state senate side, ultimately, of course, approved by the entire legislature and designed by the government. So uh, you, you will be able and have been able to ensure $30 million in the various infrastructure programs at the back to the beaches, ranging from the streets to the We'll hear a little bit about that uh, later from in the, in the so, those are our opening remarks. Uh, what you will have today is a variety of sessions. We're going to start off with an opening conversation, and then we're going to move on to uh, two panels. We'll have the, uh, Kurt Spaulding, who's the regional administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in this region. We'll take a break. And we'll have uh, one panel first, and then we'll take a break, and then a second panel. And then we'll have an open mic session. So all of you think about what you want to suggest. What is your vision? What are your questions? So we'll have an open mic session. Then uh, Cairo Shen, the city's uh, chief planner, will do a reflection and wrap up. And then we'll have box lunches. And so, at the end of the day, uh, if you want to you know, network and such, you can do that at the tables out here. And also around the cafe, we'll provide you with box lunches. And for some reason, you need to leave. And we look forward to your responses afterwards. Send us your comments online. Those of you who want to write that long, and of course, you do get responses like that. So, moving into our opening conversation. Um, we're working on the AB. It is a complicated building. This is a, a federal building, secure, and uh, as you can see, wonderful uh, building designed by Harry Cobb of Kate Cobb Green Associates. Occasionally, there are AB coaches. Not often, uh, we may be in one of those moments now. So for my colleagues, our speakers who come from out of town, they're going to wait if we don't get the system. So I'm uh, actually be tolerant. One of the things that we at the head of the uh, NGO, not a uh, non-governmental not, uh, organization, is that we know that we always have to be flexible. Uh, we're going to test our colleagues here, and I apologize in advance if for some reason we cannot get the system. So we're just going to just do a conversation. We're going to keep it light. We want to allow you also some time to ask questions and comments and such. So, uh, let me introduce our two panelists. Our first is, uh, uh, not first, but uh, Michael Morella, who is the project director in New York City's planning department for Vision 2020. 
And earlier this year, Mayor Bloomberg in New York, together with the City Council President, and Mayor Burks, who is the Chair of the New York City Planning Commission, issued a vision on each other. And Michael actually is a behind the scenes, say, the author, basically, with his staff. Uh, he's going to tell you how you can download an extraordinary plan, an extraordinary process involving uh, Michael is a graduate of MIT, and so he's familiar with our area. And uh, he was, in fact, uh, received numerous awards when he was a graduate student at MIT. He was very modest when I told him I knew he had that. So he's like, oh, no, um, our second speaker, <coughs> who's come from even further, is Brent Hogg, uh, MCIP, who's Vancouver's planning director. He has uh, done some extraordinary work. For those of you who have been able to visit the city of Vancouver, uh, they have done some incredible work on the planning, uh, involving a range of uh, commercial development, residential development, but also how they've integrated their park system, uh, setbacks, they have tall buildings. He's, I'm not going to spoil it you. He is an extraordinary leader, internationally recognized. Uh, he, in fact, uh, has generated a great deal of press coming here to work in Vancouver. I don't um, think so. I think yeah, it's because of the hard stuff. He is large in many senses. I think that I'm not, this is not meant in any way to be a, a uh, bragging or um, a statement of bravado. Um, but New York City, <laughs> um, New York City is is quite large. Uh, I, mean, I just put up these two maps this is at the same scale. New York City has approximately 520 miles of waterfront, and I bring this up. Again, not because I'm trying to brag about how large New York City is, but simply because when you think about New York City and its waterfront, you're really thinking about something on the regional level, uh, which I think is an important scale comparison uh, compared to, uh, to Boston proper. It, it really needs to begin to think of it on the regional level. Um, next slide, please. New York City, I think as many cities, but particularly here in the Northeast, grew up because of its water. Uh, this is an image from the 19th century, uh, early, uh, excuse me, late 19th century. And you can see, uh, this is an artist's uh, depiction, obviously, but one of the things I love about this image is that you can see the number of boats that this artist uh, depicts in the waterways themselves and the number of piers lining both the East River on the right and the Hudson River on the left. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an image from the 1930s, and even as Lower Manhattan and as the financial district and Wall Street grew, you can see that the ports were still very much active. You still see a number of boats in the water. Next slide, please. Of course, around the same time as when we began to build the highways that cut us, cut us off from the waterfront. Um, Boston, I think, can teach uh, both nationally and internationally some lessons about how we begin to think about these aging, these aging pieces of infrastructure. But I think as importantly as the physical barrier that these serve, is far more importantly is the emotional and psychological barrier that these highways represented. And that these, it signaled to the public that the waterfront was no longer some place where you should go. Next slide, please. New York did have a strong history of using its waters and waterfront for recreation. This is an image from 19, uh, 1901 where you can see uh, folks coming out in their Sunday desk to watch, uh, to watch canoe and kayak, canoe races rather. Uh, this is on the Harlem River in northern Manhattan. Next slide, please. Around, uh, at the same time, we were also using our waters for swimming. I love this image because you can see the piers were already deteriorating as people were, as young kids were swimming in the water. Next slide. Uh, but at the same time, we were, um, in retrospect, horrible stewards of the environment. This is open ocean dumping. This was several miles off of uh, off our coast, not in the uh, upper harbor itself. But lo and behold, a fair amount of this trash would wash up uh, upon the shores of New York City. Next slide, please. And after we built these highways, we dumped in our waterways. A lot of our waterfront, once industry moved off, uh, moved out of the city, our waterfront looked like this. This is actually a much more recent image. But in the 1970s, 80s, and even to the early 90s. Vast stretches of New York City's waterfront looked a lot like this, with abandoned buildings, crumbling infrastructure, deterioration into the water itself. 
New York City in 1992 really began to think of this waterfront as an asset, though. And this was the first comprehensive plan that the city wrote in 1992. And this plan called for uh, establishing waterfront zoning, which in New York City really began to change how the city both examined, looked at, and regulated its waterfront. One of the most important aspects of this, uh, of this rezoning, would be the, or the zoning text amendment, I should say, was that when redevelopment occurred to higher density residential, commercial, or mixed use, that there had to be the provision for public access. And this was really very revolutionary um, at the time. But um, through this through this plan and the subsequent uh, zone changes, that vast stretches of our waterfront have now been redeveloped, and with that comes public access. For the first time in literally generations, the public has been able to access the waterfront after this redevelopment. Next slide, please. We've had some great transformations on the waterfront. Let me just flip through these fairly quickly. Uh, Harlem River Park in Manhattan, next slide, please. The, um, the west side of Manhattan, Hudson River Park, taking deteriorating computers and building public access. <coughs> Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, Michael Van Valkenburg project, uh, landscape architect from uh, based in Cambridge. <coughs> and on the Park in the Bronx, where we actually took a piece of that uh, industrial infrastructure and re, uh, repainted it and integrated it into the landscape element itself, sort of commemorating the historic uses of the site, though remediating the site at the same time. So, uh, our, our work has not been solely focused on public access, but also ecological restoration for Sparrows March and Southern Brooklyn, where it was approximately a 30 acre restoration project. So we have done quite a bit over the past, uh, past few decades in improving the waterfront, but there's still this tremendous opportunity that we have before us. With 520 miles of waterfront, we have the opportunity to <coughs> begin to think, again, on this regional scale about what the waterfront and that's where we started with Vision 2020, the new comprehensive waterfront plan, looking at where do we want to be in the next 10 years and beyond to bring New York City's waterfront as water back to the state of prominence. For this process, uh, to develop this plan, we had an extensive public outreach process. We had a total of nine large public meetings, as well as dozens upon dozens of smaller meetings, community groups. Um, we have literally thousands upon thousands of New Yorkers participating in these groups. Um, and I like to think of myself a bit like Mark, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, in that we had literally millions upon millions of hits to our website. Um, not because <coughs> of the Facebook level, but not that. Uh, this was, uh, but I think that this, uh, the, the amount of public interest uh, that was generated through this project is a testament to what I think it was tested to the hard work of my staff and really reaching out to communities to talk about their waterfront. But I think far more importantly is the increasing interest in using the waterfront, really getting onto and into the water for recreation. Uh, but that has been a growing movement sort of that the city is only catching up to. Uh, that that, that uh, over the past couple of decades, there have been numerous canoeing, kayaking clubs uh, being uh, started, and people are getting out to the water like they never had before. And so the plan that we just issued uh, is organized by these eight goals, and it's really, I think, in many ways, uh, true to his name that it's very comprehensive. And that it looks at public access, redevelopment, the working water, uh, improving water quality, reestablishing and restoring the natural environment, enhancing the blue network. The blue network is the term we use to describe the waterways themselves, and using the waterways Hi. for education, recreation. Hi transportation, and really beginning to think of the water as part of the city itself. Typically, most New Yorkers think of the water as elsewhere, or the East River, for instance, as being the, something that divides the city between Manhattan and Brooklyn, or Manhattan and Queens. Whereas really, we want to begin to flip that, that, uh, that perception, and be having the public begin to think of the waters as what connects the borough. Also looking to improve government oversight. Uh, through this process, we have come to recognize that if any of these goals are to come to fruition, the government has to be in a position to actually help these projects through. And through this process, we heard numerous stories of, uh, particularly in the maritime industry, where projects 
that were supposed to take six months on paper to receive a permit end up taking seven years. And when there's that disconnect between seven years in reality and six months on paper, we have to recognize that something is wrong and something has to change, and that's what we talked about. Finally, the last goal of the, of the plan is one that lasts only because it's perhaps the greatest challenge that we face, and that's uh, addressing climate resilience and the fact that all these improvements that we are going to be making on the waterfront have to recognize that, that climate change is real and that the increased severity and intensity of storms is something that we are going to very much have to face along with the rising sea level. Let me stop there since I want to give others the opportunity to, to talk, but uh, happy to speak more about that. Can everyone hear me? Is this on? Um, thank you, Vivian. Thanks, Michael. That was very interesting. Uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here. Iris did uh, reach out and, and uh, invite me before uh, the teams were set, but I kept expecting to get the email uninviting me, and, and it never came. Um, and people have been asking me, why are you going to Boston for Game 7? <laughs> And I say bad planning. Uh, <laughs> speaking of which, um, I, I do want to uh, give a, a compliment. Kairos and I are friends, and we've been friends for the last several years, and I'm very, very um, uh, uh, admiring of his work here in, in Boston. And I think as a city, you're very lucky to have a, a creative and, and, and smart city planner here. Not every city in North America is so lucky. So I did want to say that. Um, uh, I haven't uh, prepared a formal presentation. I just, as, as Vivian requested, put together a few slides because I'm not sure how many of you can actually visualize uh, uh, our Vancouver waterfront. How many of you have actually been there in the last 10 years or so? That was interesting. A lot of hands went down. So a lot of you have been to Vancouver before the last 10 years. Is that right? Well, every year it changes, and that's one of the things you're actually going to going to see. This is one of the parts of our waterfront that's been uh, around for, for several decades. This is our um, uh, area um, uh, in uh, English Bay, uh, which is what some of our oldest uh, development areas and one of our oldest beaches. But I'm just going to go through and, and, and give you some uh, visuals and make some points based on those visuals. So go ahead. Uh, this is our skyline and it's often said Vancouver is mountains and water. Uh, not necessarily in that order. Now it's mountains and water and hockey, but, but, but it's, it's still mountains and water. And uh, uh, the, the old saying in Vancouver was, we were a setting in search of a city. It was a famous phrase made back in the 60s. And so we've been working very, very hard to build a city, and particularly a downtown in our downtown peninsula, that was worthy of its setting. And our connection of, to, to place, our genus loci, as our urban designers uh, say, uh, and that constant recognition of how we connect to our setting through uh, very, very rigorous and, and sophisticated policy and regulation is a key part of our city building process, and I'll speak to that uh, throughout. Next. So this is our downtown peninsula. Uh, it's where the most of the Vancouver reputation for city building has come. Much of it has come through the transformation of former industrial lands, something we're actually worried about now. We've essentially given up as much industrial land as we want to. And I've got very strong policy that I've been putting in place to protect the, the industrial land that we have left because it's a, going to be a key part to our resiliency as a city in the future. But it is ironic that most of our city building reputation has been on these uh, former transformed industrial lands. And we focused on making them not destinations, uh, not uh, uh, um, particularly entertainment destinations. I've seen uh, far too much attention given to waterfront redevelopments across North America in particular that's been based on that. For us, it was about livability. Our actual uh, uh, original uh, phrase that my predecessor, Larry Beasley, used was living first, and that applied within the waterfront as well. Uh, so it was about compact, complete, livable residential neighborhoods on the water, but never, never giving up uh, the publicness, uh, the public uh, uh, ownership and access of the water edge. And we built a, a number of principles and tools to make that happen, but you see, most of what you see along the water edge has been transformation of former industrial lands. Next slide. Uh, this is our context, Falls Creek, you'll hear me reference, and then the Burrard Inlet, uh, the convention centers on the Burrard Inlet set, and I'll show you some images of that. And Falls Creek, which is where most of our, our, our early transformations, including most recently our Athletes Village for the 2010 Winter Games, has been along the Falls Creek area. Next. So this is the kind of context we have, and what you see is high density uh, residential housing 
but uh, in, a, in a particular uh, building form that, that is now synonymous with the so-called Vancouver model or Vancouverism, uh, I, I think rather lazily, and I always shudder when I hear that kind of connection because our approach is much more than a particular building type. But it's, a, it's about uh, what we call podium and point tower. The idea that you could do residential high-rise towers, but you do them uh, in a highly designed way uh, with always your, your uh, stepping down to the water, uh, rigorous shadow analysis to make sure that the seawall is never shattered at key times when it's being used. And then we push back the towers. Uh, and we step and stage, and uh, uh, as we say it, the towers are there to provide the views and the value in the marketplace, but they uh, float out of the perception of the walker, as we put it, and, and it's actually the podiums that provide that human scale that is European, uh, and, it's, and it's been called a hybrid that is the best of both worlds. We have the kind of European scale podiums and the high-rise towers, but highly designed and regulated high-rise towers. And of course, a, a, an awful lot of attention to the public realm along the seawall. Thanks. Uh, so again, just a few illustrations. And you see that constant uh, publicness of the seawall. But the interface between residential property and public space is very close. But it's designed, that interface is designed very carefully. With a few steps up, a clear differentiation of what is semi-public and, and fully public uh, as we go through the design process. Next. Uh, the towers that you see, the one, the one thing you'll, you'll notice, and we, we've been noticing it as we've got to town with your warm earth tone colors in Boston, we look, at, we look at those colors and we say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Because it's different than ours. Uh, because our architecture is, is glass, it's concrete, it's steel. It's been called cold. Some people think it's beautiful, some people think it's cold. The most common phrase I get from Vancouverites and visitors is, we love the city, we love the urbanism, but why do all the buildings look the same? So that's one of the things I've actually been vigorously pushing on to get much more architectural diversity and match that architectural diversity to actual energy performance. So it's not a, a sort of an irresponsible architecture. Next. Uh, this is a sense of the kind of transformation that we've had in just 20 years. And this is why Vancouver gets so much attention. There's, there's very few other cities that have seen this level of transformation uh, in, in essentially a generation or two, depending on your definition of what a generation is. Click to the next slide. Uh, there we go. So you get a sense of, of the kind of extent of transformation. In about 20 years, 50,000 more people within our downtown peninsula than were there before. By far the largest residential population growth of any city in North America. Uh, one of the real successes in this, um, I'll come back to that because I can't remember if I've got a slide. Go ahead. There it is. Um, I still sit on panels. I just did another uh, interview on this where I sit beside someone from San Francisco, or most recently it was San Francisco, who insisted that uh, families will never live downtown. And, and, and I say, we are the evidence that that is completely untrue. In 20 years, we've gone from 40 kids in our downtown peninsula to 7,000 kids in our downtown peninsula. And it's because we didn't cross our fingers and wish and pray. We use that term that always uh, uh, puts a shudder through American crowds, regulation. Uh, and we say that regulation is our friend. If, if we want something bad enough, we regulate it. So we've got requirements that say that 25% of all units within, within our buildings have to meet our family-friendly design guidelines. We negotiate through density bonusing, daycare, we get school sites, we, we, we regulate the, the kid-friendly amenity, we design the public realm in a way that is friendly for kids because we say that public realm that's good for kids is good for everyone. So it hasn't been wishing and praying, it's been deliberate regulation to achieve the vision, which has not just been population growth, it's been a diverse population growth, and particularly the kids. The kids are the indicator species for a good urbanism. And this image is not, by the way, uh, unindicative. Uh, we in Vancouver, I have people coming up to me all the time saying, uh, we've had, we're having our third child, our fourth child, we're thinking, gee, we might, we're having a hard time living in the condo still. And that's a remarkable statement, since in most cities, people have that conversation when they have their first child. We have families with children moving to our downtown, and it's because we're designing it to be family friendly. Next. So uh, three components of what I call density done well. Uh, a counterintuitive approach to land use and movement, where we integrate our engineering and transportation department are best friends. And our engineers actually say that the most important transportation plan is a land use plan. And I think most of you probably recognize how rare it is for engineers to actually say that. But we take a completely integrated approach <coughs> to our, 
our land <coughs> and it's land use first because um, okay, next um, we go ahead and click one more time we're the only city in North America that said completely no to freeways we have no freeways within our area I, I, I significantly admire the bearing of the central artery except I probably would have not bothered rebuilding it underground uh, just taking it away uh, probably would have been the better thing but we we never had to have that debate because we never built them in the first place and we, thus we took a counterintuitive approach to all of our thinking after saying no to freeways in the late 1960s or early 1970s. Next slide. This is uh, where the freeways would have gone doing the same thing it's done to every city in North America cutting off the waterfront, decimating, lobotomizing the downtown this is our, everywhere where there's freeways, we have urbanism. We have public realm urbanism, green space, our convention center. Everything that's special about Vancouver, even the Olympic Cauldron, is the place where the freeway would have been. Plus, we would have wiped out low-income diverse communities, all the same stories that you've heard from other cities. Uh, we use the water as uh, uh, life, amenity, and transportation. These are the, the quaint ones. This is our sort of, it's, it's part transportation, part tourism. These are the aqua buses that we use in Falls Creek. On the other side of the peninsula, we have the sea bus, which takes 40 to 50,000 people, commuters from North Vancouver to, to central, center city of Vancouver, uh, every single day. Uh, it's, it runs as many people as our subways do. And it's a, it's a completely integrated piece of our, our overall regional transportation system. I wish I had an image of our, of our C bus. These are our aqua buses. Next. Uh, the second piece is a design quality. We have an extremely high standard for design quality, both the public realm and architecture. And we, it's highly regulated. We have a very high standard. We're prepared to say no to anything that doesn't meet our standard. And thus we find we really have to say no, because the marketplace adjusts to our high standard and proposes very well designed project. Next. Uh, it starts with our waterfront design, again, that constant attention to the, the water edge of the public realm where most of our life really is. Next. Uh, we regulate height, as I said, so this may look accidental, uh, but it's completely deliberate. When we allow towers, they have to meet our minimum uh, separation distance standards, 80 feet, which provides sunlight access um, uh, in between uh, towers. It uh, mitigates shadow and wind, etc., and it provides privacy between towers. We say that, that uh, our, our myth is that you can look at a naked person across at the next tower, and unless you have binoculars, you wouldn't get a good look. Um, it's a bit of a myth. You can actually get a good look. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone has binoculars. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's, it's highly regulated. So we, when we show these to our European, European cities are fascinated by Vancouver because they don't like high rises. But what most European urbanists, Jan Dale comes to town quite a bit, and he always says, I'm not convinced that we need to do towers, but if we do choose to do towers, we should do them like Vancouver does, which is a highly designed approach. Next. And again, just constant attention to public realm. But you see that relationship of bike and walking and semi-private and private. And it's all through just subtle changes in grade, differentiation of the space, highly designed. Uh, row houses have been a, a big part of our built form. Increasingly, we're actually looking for a higher urban wall, a street wall podium. But the point is, we humanize uh, all of our edge. We virtually ban blank walls anywhere in the city, but particularly along our waterfront. All the, the, the building edge, all the street wall, the city at eye level, as, as the saying goes, has to be active. It's either retail or it's store yards or, or, or door frontages or what have you. No dead space, period. Next. Uh, keep going. I'll uh, flash through a few. That's Cole Harbor, the other side. Keep going. Uh, we uh, even, um, you know, to, to, to really run the risk of being accused of, of uh, being control freaks, we sculpt our skyline. Kairos actually came to town at my invitation and provided some peer review for us on our on our recent review of our view corridors. But this is a part of us, our connection to our space. So we've protected public views to the mountains uh, from key ceremonial boulevards and public parks throughout the city. 27 protected view corridors, which we've just reviewed for their success after 20 years. We actually added three new uh, view corridors after the review. Some people wanted us to get rid of them. We reviewed it and we ended up adding three. Uh, keep going. 
Um, so we've had street end views to the mountains and water, uh, our view corridors, and we've even shaped our, our skyline from a design perspective. Keep going. And the third piece is amenities. And it's not just, uh, uh, obviously, the public realm and the water edge, but everything from parks, daycare, civic facilities, cultural facilities. We leverage the private sector through negotiation of what we call the land lift from developers to pay for all of this. We need more of this than any other city in North America because we are a poor city. All Canadian cities are poor by American standards. We only have the property tax revenue. You guys have so many more uh, revenue tools at your disposal than we are allowed to have. So we leverage density uh, to pay for almost everything that makes Vancouver livable. And we've been very successful. Keep up. So uh, we've achieved our beaches that way. Keep going. Our, our, our public edge. Keep going. Our parks. Keep going. Uh, this is Stanley Park. We even name our parks after the Stanley Cup. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, our parks and civic spaces, keep going. Uh, all of the things that you might uh, expect, we would have a very hard time paying for them, so we get developers to pay for them. Uh, Granville Island is one of our examples of something very, very counterintuitive and, and, and mixed. Uh, Young Gale calls this the best example in North America of all the principles in his new book, uh, Cities for People, which you should all read, great book. Uh, that he's seen in North America. It mixes uh, factories with art space, with, with uh, farmers markets, uh, in a public realm that is a completely, it's not even shared space, it's pedestrian priority space, where you can't really tell where the cars should go and the people should go. And it works very, very well. It's been around for about 20 years, 20, well, no, 30, 40 years. Keep going. So there's it uh, in your plan. Keep going. Oh, how did that slip in the <laughs> That's it? <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I, I show this to show that when, uh, when we had the Winter Games, uh, it has transformed the way we think about a public realm. We actually had a reputation in Vancouver as the most livable city in the world, but a no-fun city. And that even translates into our waterfront. One of the criticisms we do get for our waterfront is it's highly livable, but not enough entertainment, not enough destination, not enough activity. And so the new areas, we have restaurants and, and staggered things, but we don't have clusters of energy along our waterway. So the new areas that I'm planning now around, it, ironically, where the Canucks play, uh, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a very different place where it's play, work, live, instead of live, work, play, which is the way our waterfront has been designed up to this point. Uh, but this is the way that Vancouverites are now embracing the public realm. We had 75,000 people celebrating our Game 2 win, which I thought was kind of jinxing. Uh, and then over 100,000 people celebrating our Game 5 win. And they're completely taking over the public realm. And we're facilitating that through, through showing the games in our streets and along our water edge. And it's a great, it, it, this has been a huge transformation uh, from just 10 years ago, where Vancouver was considered a, a kind of a staid and quiet place. Uh, the convention center uh, is the our population by about 50,000 people, so that's an awful lot of development. And we've uh, figured out that we've leveraged, on top of the standard things like development charges and such, we've leveraged through our negotiation process with developers probably $600 million of, of amenity. Uh, and we, as I say, we do everything you think you're doing, uh, we're doing that, but we're doing more. And, and uh, the, 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 the surprising thing for people is the developers are not taking us to court. They're not, uh, they're not uh, upset, well, <laughs> they wouldn't be, but, but, they wouldn't be but they wouldn't be building if it didn't work because we actually use a performa-based negotiation approach. We know when they're making money. We know how their, their, their profit works. It actually suppresses the land value so they can pick up the land for cheaper. So the money's staying with the developers who are taking the risk rather than the property owners that have just been sitting on land for generations. But, but so the system works very well. <clears throat> what you've done magnificently. 20 or 30 years preceded demand. In other words, you That's correct. That's we, we actually say we created demand. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, and, it, and it worked when market cycles were doing this. 
when the downturn happened, which barely touched us, frankly, and we were the last to be affected and the first to recover, and we're in a boom right now, uh, uh, people kept saying, well, you can't do that anymore, right? It's a downturn. No, we, we do it. We've been doing it before the demand and after every, because it fosters, it protects, it creates the demand. People say, you do that because Vancouver is successful. And we say, well, we started it before Vancouver was successful. And it's been one of the reasons Vancouver's market has been so resilient. And our, and, and our reputation for livability is part of the vote form. Um, the convention center, I want to show it because it's not only uh, apparently the greenest convention center in North America now, Lee Platinum, but in my opinion, the most urban. And it shows the principles again about they didn't want to, uh, the province who built it didn't want to do the seawall all the way around. We forced them to. They didn't want to do uh, retail stores lining that seawall. You don't have retail stores lining the edge of a convention center. Uh, we insisted and, and they did it. And uh, it's, it's, remar it's working remarkably well. Um, and uh, we did also did um, a, a habitat restoration and the sea lions have come back, uh, 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 something like 30 new species coming back into the Burrard Inlet through that kind of a work. And I just love how urban this is. It, it may not be on the cover of architectural magazines because it wasn't designed by anybody you've heard of, but it's the most urban convention center I've ever seen, where most convention centers are obnoxious VCRs landing on waterfronts or downtown. Uh, and the, the second largest green roof in North America. Uh, keep going, I'll skip past this. Uh, we do have a port, uh, and it does work, and we, we haven't been eating into it, and we're very concerned about protecting the land and uses that have strategic relationships to the port. And the port interacts with the city. Uh, we haven't tried to put a big fence around it. Keep going. Uh, and railway, too. Keep going. Uh, and lastly, the Olympic Village, uh, which has uh, been a, a game changer for us in terms of how we do our urbanism. So keep going. We're, um, we're now uh, moving from high-rise as our uh, presumed built form to mid-rise with, with high-rises as strategic exceptions as we densify the rest of the city. And the Olympic Village has been our model. All the buildings are at least lead gold. Uh, it got the highest lead and the rating of any uh, community so far. So it's been called the greenest neighborhood in North America. Uh, district energy, uh, the, all of the, the heat of water and, and space is, is uh, generated from sewer heat recovery, from the actual sewer line. Keep going. Uh, and uh, from a public realm perspective, some of it's, it's taken our seawall design approach that we've done over 20 years of continued, 20 to 40 years of continuous seawall, and it's taken it to a new level. Keep going. Uh, with with a, a quality of public realm that we're just very, very pleased with. Keep going. Um, I think that's my last slide. <coughs> Again. Uh, just to continue this conversation, I, I wanted to explore with our two speakers a, a couple of questions. You know, we talk in Boston a lot about uh, uh, we talk a lot about 24/7 livable community. Uh, res you mentioned residential. Uh, so in your plan, did you allow for more residential uses along the line? How do we think about making it? Sure. Well, New York City, um, like to think of itself, of course, as a city that never sleeps. So it's, um, in some ways, it might be hard pressed to find a neighborhood that's not already um, point where point where seven community. However, I would argue that Lower Manhattan traditionally, um, for a city that never sleeps, we had a financial district that um, was safely tucked into bed by about six o'clock. Um, and over the past ten years, um, really after 9/11, a lot of money has uh, been reinvested in Lower Manhattan to make that a 24-hour community. And part of that has been allowing for redevelopment for residential uses. And part of that is actually providing new amenities, particularly along the waterfront. Um, those who know Lower Manhattan well, you know at the very southern tip of Lower Manhattan, there's Battery Park. And on the west side, along the Hudson River, there's uh, Battery Park City and fantastic, marvelous public spaces in the public realm there. Uh, but on the east side, where the FDR uh, the FDR Highway uh, was built. Um, east of the highway itself was largely vacant, uh, vacant for former industrial peers, uh, but with very, very little activity. Um, but with the course of the last 10 years, we've begun reinvesting in the particularly on the east side along the East River um, and looking at how, without tearing down the highway, how we can uh, begin to 
encourage the new residents of Lower Manhattan to get out to the waterfront. Uh, in fact, just about uh, eight days from now, we'll be opening up the first phase of that public uh, of the public access area. It was designed by shop architects um, in New York Bay architectural. Uh, but I think it would really, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how successful it is in encouraging people to go under the elevated highway. Um, one of the techniques that they used, which is very simple and relatively low cost, was simply painting the underside of the highway in bright purple. Um, it's kind of a little quirky uh, nod to the fact that this is now a different space. This is no longer the dark, rather um, intimidating space that it once was. It's now more fun. And we've built new uh, public access, new public piers, as well as an esplanade along the portion of the East River in Lower Manhattan. So I think it's really going to, um, to become a true amenity. Um, I think that it remains to be seen. It's still early in the process to see if it turns into a true 24 hour community. Um, I think the amenities, like restaurants and the like, are slowly coming into the neighborhood. Um, but it's, I think, I think Wall Street and Lower Manhattan now going to bed around 8, 9, maybe 10 o'clock. So I think we're making some progress. Right. Can I ask, uh, you've talked about uh, on a lot of residential. Is there a mixing problem? Um, is it more high end? I mean, on our waterfront, because of the high cost of construction on the waterfront, we're seeing more of the residential development basically being uh, non affordable. Uh, if, if left to the, the basic market, it would all be unaffordable uh, for construction cost reasons, but also just because this is the most um, sought after real estate in the East Canada. We're, we are the most expensive city uh, in Canada and one of the most expensive in the world. And that's because uh, we have a huge amount of not only um, demand coming from people who want to move to Vancouver, but a lot of option money, uh, particularly given uh, uh, our relationship with Pacific Rim, and increasingly money from Germany, Russia, etc. So we're seen as a safe haven for, for real estate investment. Uh, so that puts tremendous pressures on our affordability throughout the city. The waterfront, you know, even in, in the downturn, there was um, properties were going for for twelve, fourteen hundred dollars uh, a square foot. Uh, so, uh, and, and up to the high point, it was over 2,000 a square foot uh, uh, along it, it, in the downtown in general and higher in the water. We have policies that, that uh, require social integration. We require certain amount of rental. We require all of um, uh, the projects to set aside 20% of the land or airspace for social housing projects because we actually mix actual supportive housing into the highest real estate in North America or most expensive. Uh, and, and then uh, we're doing, as an example, 14 social housing projects mixed in through all those neighborhoods. And one of our principles, we play the game spot the social housing because it's hard and we design them in a way that they integrate well into the area. One of our basic founding values, all of our urbanism flows from our values and one of our values is integration. Communities are not good communities if they are just rich communities. That's a real struggle, struggle for us because the mark, all the market forces are really Talk a little bit about the working port in Vancouver. Uh, sure. It's uh, it's very easy to for New Yorkers to forget that New York's uh, New York City was and really still is uh, a tremendous working harbor. That um, in fact, we're the <coughs> largest uh, port complex in New York, New Jersey port complex. It's the largest on the East Coast, third largest in the United States. Um, and what this means is that there are literally billions upon billions of dollars of goods um, that are brought into New York Harbor every day. Um, so 90% of the goods that we import are brought in by ship. Um, and so uh, to New York audiences, I often say it's from the cell phone in your pocket to the bowl that you were chewing your cereal out of that morning. Um, so it's likely brought in by ship. Um, and what this means is that, that we have to recognize that though we no longer see it as part of our, uh, our daily lives, we still need to have policies that support the, the working harbor. And that means everything from uh, the dredging needs to allow the larger ships to come into port to uh, the tremendously expensive projects that have elevated bridges to accommodate the larger and larger ships that are going to be coming to the East Coast as a result of the widening of the Panama Canal. 
um, to smaller things, like making certain that there's adequate time space for tubs and barges uh, in New York Harbor. Uh, though I think a lot of, you know, when we talk about the ports, we think of these mega container, container ships and the terminals, the online facilities, but it's also the tug and barge, uh, tug and barges are really the workhorses of the, of the port. And being able to, be able to find time space for them uh, and the facilities that they need is also part of the plan. One of the things I think that's going to be really interesting that we're going to be doing is we're looking at how we can uh, begin to accommodate more and more time space for tugs and barges in with other development, recognizing that our industrial waterfront, the needs have changed over the years, and that we still have a fair amount of land in our industrial, uh, on our industrial site that are no longer needed for the types of uses that previously were. So we can think about allowing for additional uses on the upland portions, portions of those sites while providing for tug and barge tie up on the water's edge, and that there might be a synthesis and a, uh, uh, a co benefits of having new uses on the upland portions while having uh, additional time space for tubs and barges. Uh, no, uh, uh, but uh, I'd say there's there's always this pressure and assumption, there's become this assumption in North America that you're just waiting for the port to leave, to relocate to another place where it's not in the way of expanded urbanism. It's incredibly important to the urbanism and the carbon footprint of your, your city to have that close relationship of origin, destination, landing point, and, and destination and marketplace. So we have no intention of our port uh, leaving, we're protecting it. And we're protecting the strategic relationships that the port needs to cheap industrial land throughout the city and region. Uh, and in a city that's known for its livability, you know, I've had to say living first is over. Uh, uh, we're not emphasizing living at the expense of other things. Now our model is the complete city, and we're protecting uh, our industrial land, our port uses from the very high profitability of residential development. I'm going to open up for a couple questions and then we need to go on to the next session. So, okay, Ivy. Ivy St. John, Charlestown Waterfront Coalition. Um, I'll set the stage for the question. The Boston Transportation uh, Department has done a wonderfully creative plan which reduces highway through our community. We've always been a regional uh, highway in the colonial times going up to Salem and the villages and cities on the North Shore. And now we're really from northwest suburbs coming through Charlestown to get downtown. The VTD plan has created, uh, has reduced one of the avenues from eight to four lanes um, and taken out a tunnel in a, uh, a very heavily trafficked circle. Um, what we find is new people <coughs> who have attended the seven community meetings and seen the data, the traffic studies, et cetera, are fully in support. Our problem is the community has become divided. Uh, old timers who didn't attend the meetings um, think this new traffic plan is simply not going to work. So my question to you is, I'm sure you met the same, you're, you're nodding, I'm, I'm sure you met the same kind of concern and opposition, and I'm curious how the two of you, perhaps it wasn't as serious in Vancouver as it must have been in New York, but I appreciate your ex, uh, your discussion of how you dealt with that those counter forces. So uh, Ivy's question is about transportation and uh, two different organizations and entities that, you know, who, how do we come to a decision on some of these transportation I think uh, in our experience and my professional experience a bit more broadly, uh, I think it could be any number of topics, transportation, land use, um, social housing, whatever it may be, there's always points of contention. Um, and in planning, we love to think about how we just strike the word balance um, and, uh, and that somehow we will solve the world problem by finding this magical balance. Um, the trouble is, is that that's actually, I think, not very true in the end. And that there, in the end, there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. And I think that the term that we would just begin to think about for it is reconciling. Reconciling the different needs and different, uh, uh, different um, beliefs. But I think one way that we can go about getting to uh, reconciliation, if you will, is by having, spending um, what ultimately is lots and lots of times in discussions. 
Um, and that community forums are only one way of doing that. I think particularly in times when there's a, a particularly contentious issue, having smaller and smaller meetings, um, perhaps series of meetings to discuss these things. So the long established uh, community members who don't attend these larger meetings, having individual meetings with them, you know, sitting around a, a kitchen table, if you will, if that's what is necessary, to begin to talk through these issues and to very slowly bring up, uh, bring up these, uh, the facts and the studies uh, in support of these projects. I think that uh, as, as important as it is as a planner to be able to come up with the policies and these ideas, um, I think far more importantly as part of my job is being able to discuss them and discuss them in both large public meetings, smaller, uh, smaller workshops, whatever it may be. Uh, and I think that's what it often takes to be able to ultimately convince folks. From our perspective, this is a fundamental to the Vancouver model of city building. Uh, I, I agree completely, balance is a myth. Um, when you balance things, cars win because they're heavy and they crush people. So you can't put them on an equal playing field. Since the 1990s, Vancouver's official policy has not been balance, it's been prioritization. Walking, then cycling, then transit, then the movement of goods and services for economic development, and then the single occupancy vehicle. And we do it in that order, all of our capital planning, our public ground design, our streetscape design, all of our thinking is in that order. So we've rarely banned the car, we just prioritize it last, is the way we put it. So we've been systematically over 20 years removing car capacity and putting it into bikes, widened sidewalks, except, and, and bus only lanes and transit. And um, uh, up until this last couple of years when we, we did a, a great deal of work on separated bike lanes like New York, we're seeing the same kind of controversies. But you know, people are arguing about how to do it, not whether to do it. Uh, and and uh, that's a key thing. Uh, that, that you win with data and repetition of data, and you never let false information stand. That's the way we do it. Because people will fill the papers with false information about density, adding to congestion, and, and taking away car lanes, adding to congestion. So use Vancouver. There is only one city in all of North America that has been had, that has reduced con, uh, congestion, reduced commuting times, remu reduced the absolute number of cars coming into the downtown, and the percentage of cars, while increasing the number of trips, the population, and the jobs. There's only one city that's done it, and that's Vancouver. And we've done it by doing the opposite of what the traffic engineers across North America have said. We've done it by removing car capacity. And we have fewer cars. It's actually easier to drive around downtown than it was 20 years ago, even though we have 50,000 more people downtown and about 40,000 more jobs. And that's counterintuitive, but the data proves it. You can never improve commute times, congestion, through building road capacity. It always digs yourself deeper in the hole. There's no city that's ever succeeded. One more question, and I'm going to tell you, he's going to be around. We're both going to be around at the coffee room. Okay, so. Thank you. Um, my name is Melanie Ray. I um, have worked in, in, in the Fort Point neighborhood for, for a while now, and I'm on the Fort Point Neighborhood um, Association Board. I um, just want to comment and ask for, uh, for um, your comments. Um, the recession um, has successfully preserved vast stretches of asphalt in our neighborhood um, to benefit um, and as a cash machine to be um, large um, uh, private owners and developers and has um, really delayed improvements of the public revenue <coughs> that are part of the master plan um, and uh, which has been a, a terrific disservice to the growing um, families who need uh, playgrounds um, there's a growing population of dogs and, and of um, gardens that we'd like to separate from each other and need dog parks. Um, there are opportunities, one would think, for the program uses that are perhaps seasonal, um, both rentals um, as, as the docks are being developed, um, farmers markets, uh, what have you. Uh, programming of these lots that, that the, the large owners have resisted and it's appalling in terms of the water runoff and all of the things um, that are harmful about the stretches <coughs> of property that um, when you look at the aerials last night, that's, that's, if you're not looking at the sea, you're looking at the parking lots. 
Um, so I wonder uh, what your thoughts are, um, each of you, um, on how to make use of those areas while we wait for the market, if, if that's the culture here in the market here to have to wait versus how Ben uh, I think that um, there's relying on the model for the uh, private sector to build the public amenities uh, is a great model and works really well when the economy uh, is is able to provide those uh, provide it. The trouble is, is times like now uh, where the, the, without the without the assurance that the residential units or commercial units are going to fill up, a developer is just not going to take that risk. Um, I think that there are things that can be done uh, on sites as temporary uses that have been proven throughout North America and the world to be quite successful. Um, getting a developer who owns that site to give up their revenue for parking for a day, half day, whatever it may be, uh, is a challenge. I know in New York City, um, we've been able to do it successfully when a developer owns an established building and also the lot next door that they'll allow temporary uses on that adjacent lot as an event, new amenity for the uh, for the residents of the building that they recently constructed. So, for instance, in the uh, Williamsburg waterfront, um, there's the, what's known as the Flea, it's flea market uh, every uh, every Sunday, uh, which is uh, during the warmer months on the waterfront itself. And vendors from out New York sell homemade goods, uh, <coughs> by homemade um, broken beef, beef jerky, for instance. Um, and uh, they also have food vendors during the day as well. Um, but again, trying to, if it's a developer who just owns the land who's squatting on it until, um, until someone comes along to buy them out, um, giving them an economic incentive to, uh, to use that space temporarily is going to be a challenge. You know, there's, there's an easy solution there. But I think thinking about what those temporary uses could be is an important first step. I'd say you have to look at the barriers uh, that exist in your system. I, my, my citizens have frustration with parts of our, our city too that aren't seeing action. There's not, every city, even uh, booming ones, have areas that are stagnating. And we are good at leveraging activity uh, and our tools for how to make things happen when the activity isn't happening uh, are tougher. And luckily we've still got a very strong market. Uh, but in other areas, you know, uh, look to your tax system. We were just talking about this at a conference in Toronto yesterday, where often the tax system actually disincentivizes activity because it gives you a tax break for having a parking lot. By the way, parking lots are also a use. So I don't know how it is here, but in Vancouver, it's a conditional use, which means I don't have to grant it. Uh, you, have to, you have to apply and you have to consider whether a parking lot is a good use or not. You don't have an automatic right to use your for parking. Um, and um, if if you got, for example, taxed based on the, the development potential rather than taxed based on the use, then there would be an incentive to develop the land. But if you're not taxed that way, it's a disincentive. You know, in, in Vancouver, there's actually a tax uh, incentive to converting your site temporarily to a park or a community garden because you can apply to put your land in a different tax bracket uh, while it's sitting. So, and, and then developers come to me and, and say, you won't give me trouble when I try to remove the, the community garden when I want to develop because they're really nervous about that because the community is outraged that they're losing the community garden. So we say we promise you, won't, you know, we won't we won't punish you for doing the right thing temporarily, and then they do it. So often it's about things that are outside the city's control, at least in Vancouver, because tax systems are provincial and, and federal. Well, I think we've had a fabulous conversation. So I want to thank both Michael and Ben for coming. They've agreed to stay. Definitely talk to them at break and hopefully stay for lunchtime so we can have a, a, a longer conversation. But thank you so much.